Hi, I'm Benjamin Payne. At the K-12 Education Office at Hillsdale College, we support school founding groups and their efforts to start classical schools across the country. Finding the right leader is one of the first and most important steps to building a successful school. While we do consider experience in education, we seek candidates who exhibit unwavering personal integrity, honesty, courage, and servant-hearted leadership. Perhaps that's you. If you're looking to engage in fulfilling, impactful, and challenging work protecting our nation's future and building up the next generation of virtuous citizens, we'd love to hear from you. I'm looking for strong school leaders right now. Learn more about how you can make a difference at hillsdale.edu slash leader. hillsdale.edu slash L-E-A-D-E-R. That's hillsdale.edu slash leader. Welcome to the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast, bringing you insight into classical education and its unique emphasis on human virtue and moral character, responsible citizenship, content-rich curricula, and teacher-led classrooms. Now your host, Scott Bertram. Thanks for listening. The Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast is part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.com. Dot hillsdale dot edu or wherever you find your audio. You also can find more information on topics and ideas discussed on this show at our website, k12.hillsdale.edu. We continue our series of episodes from presentations delivered at the Hoagland Center for Teacher Excellence Seminar on the Art of Teaching Mathematics. The Hoagland Center for Teacher Excellence is an outreach of the Hillsdale College K-12 Education Office, offering seminars in classical academics and pedagogy for teachers nationwide of any background. Seminars are led by the faculty, leadership, and master teachers of Hillsdale College. There is no cost to attend, and attendees may earn professional development credits. To learn more and to register, visit the webpage for the Hoagland Center at k 12 hillsdale.edu. Click the events tab and look for Hoagland Center for Teacher Excellence. Or write to cte at hillsdale.edu. In November 2023, Nikki Teeple from Atlanta Classical Academy spoke to a gathering of teachers and school leaders in an address titled, Playing Games in Mathematics Class. Uh, now I have the privilege of introducing you to our afternoon speaker, Mrs. Nikki Teeple. Nikki is the math coordinator at Atlanta Classical Academy. Uh, She has taught preschool, elementary, middle, and high school in both private and in public schools. As the math coordinator at Atlanta Classical Academy, Nikki oversees math curriculum for kindergarten through sixth grade. Her favorite part of this position is working with both teachers and students in and out of the classroom. She and her husband have two children, one in seventh grade and one in ninth grade at Atlanta Classical Academy. Uh, And both of those kids have attended ACA since they were in kindergarten. Uh, Nikki has told me that her superpower is speaking to kids. And she sort of implied that her kryptonite was speaking to adults, but I don't believe her. So why don't you put your hands together and welcome uh, Mrs. Tiefel to us. So I have another confession to make. At my school, Atlanta Classical Academy, I share an office with our literacy coordinator, and I'm jealous of her. She has our students reading for fun and getting excited about all the books. It is amazing to see them enjoying and sharing good stories. So let me ask you a question. Think back to this summer. How many of you enjoyed a really good book? Now, how many of you enjoyed a really good math problem? I mean, really, who says that? I just want to solve problems for fun. Even the word problem is a problem, right? Here's a definition of problem that I found. Noun. A matter or situation regarded as unwelcome or harmful, and needing to be dealt with and overcome. Yeah, let's do some problems. So when we say problems in math class, what are we saying? 
What do math problems in the textbook solve? Students are smart. They know that solving problems for the sake of a book telling them to solve the problem is just meaningless. Yes, there may be practice and routine involved, but what am I really accomplishing by solving the problems in the book? When we teach students math, we're trying to teach them to become problem solvers. But I challenge you to consider a twist on the words, problem solvers. When we teach students math, we are really trying to teach them to become puzzle solvers first in order to lead them to become strong problem solvers. Over the summer, my family played a game called Wordle. Maybe you've heard of it. The game was fun. It was relaxing. It was challenging. No one cried. No one gave up. No one asked me, what's the point of doing this? When we finished, my son Reed said, Mom, this puzzle was much more fun than the one you had this morning. What puzzle would that read? Oh, the puzzle of figuring out how to make pancakes without eggs. Yes, Reed, that was a puzzle. Puzzle. Puzzles. Hmm. Huh. I think puzzles can be broken up into two groups. Puzzles to fix something, which we refer to as a problem, and puzzles for fun, which we refer to as games. Now, there is a handout in your packet that I put some of these things in there so that y'all can just kind of enjoy, engage, and write notes to me of questions you have. And what is a math class? It's puzzle time. And games are the math equivalent to good books in literacy. Games are the equivalent to good books in literacy. Huh. At Atlanta Classical Academy, we decided to dedicate one 40-minute period each week to number sense and games. And this was for our lower school, K through 5 or K through 6. And we called this numeracy class. This class allows students to just spend time with numbers. Same way they spend time with good books. When we first implemented this, I had big dreams and ideas for this time. You can see I'm very animated, and that's really, I was so excited. I was so excited about students spending time with numbers and good games. But then I felt a little guilty. I'm using school time to play games. I was scared that students would catch on that they were actually doing more math and rebel against me. I'll be honest, some things worked really well and some things not so well. But I learned a lot, and in the end, we had incredible, incredible increases in our math scores across all grades. But the result that I'm most proud of is not my test scores. It's the fact that 85% of my students, K through 6, said they like math. They like math. Numeracy has quickly become a favorite class time for our students. Some of them like it better than recess. I still shake my head. They like math. We like math. That's why we, we teach math. Unless you're required to. But Our upper school is beginning to implement games into their math class. And as our lower school students grow into the upper school, there's going to be even more game and puzzle time in the upper school. But it changes their mindset. So let's go ahead and just talk about games. What makes a good math game? A good math game should have a combination of three elements, skill, strategy, and luck. Let me explain a little further. A good math game should have an element of skill. This is the practice of math that you see on worksheets, but are now required to be done mentally. We heard from Miss O'Brien and mental math, very important. 
The math skills do not always have to be calculations, though. They could be spatial skills and reasoning and probability. A good math game should have an element of strategy. Now, there's no procedure for this because every time you play a game, something will be different. We talk about procedures in math. Students are not following a recipe. If you're a baker, if you don't follow that recipe to a T, it's not going to be good. But math is not following a recipe. With a game, there's no procedure because each time you play, something is different. This is what brings the practice of problem solving or puzzle solving to games. And lastly, there should be an element of luck. This is my favorite element. Luck evens the playing field. Every level of student can play each other and win or lose. We have seniors that come into our classes and assist. And it is a lot of fun this past week seeing a second grade student beat a senior. The senior had no idea what was going on. Our school virtue of humility was in action. Boy, is it hard to lose when you don't have control over the outcome. Life's not fair, is it? Have you ever met someone who has all the luck? Hmm. Might be an important life lesson. Now, logistically, there are a few other things that I want in a game. I like games that are quick and allow for multiple rounds. Now, how many of y'all could dedicate 50 minutes every other day just for playing games? A little tough. But if you have a five-minute quick game, you could fit that in, right? But also, students, when the game is short, you can play multiple rounds. The more you play, the more you're going to try out different strategies. And students will have more confidence to take risk. The more you play, the more you learn. A game should also have simple rules. I ask students to recall directions for me, and some of my grades, we have a math journal. We call it our game master for the week, and the students have to write out the instructions on how to play the game. Math is the art of explanation. There you go. I also modify some of my games so that all grade levels can play. Lastly, a game should have minimal materials. I want students to be able to play a game in a moment's notice. And if you have a lot of items to bring out and then put away, you lose time. And if you're like me, I lose motivation. I don't like a lot of things. For your information, Monopoly is not on my list of good math games. Too many rules, too many materials, takes too long to complete a game, and in the Teeple House, it always ends up in World War III. Well, what are some good math games? I divide up games into four categories. First, spatial games. These are games like tic-tac-toe or dots and boxes. Or a favorite at our school is ultimate tic-tac-toe. This is where, wherever you go in the mini board the little tic-tac-toes, will send your opponent to the corresponding mini board in the large board. Totally changes the game. Another type of game that I like, or another section of games, would be skill games. These are the games where there are math skills that are seen clearly as part of the game. For example, crypto and chocolate chip cookies, which we're going to play in a little bit. Then there are puzzle-style games. How many people have ever played Sudoku? Okay. Another version of it is called a Ken Ken puzzle. These can usually be played individually or collaboratively. And lastly, there's exploration games. This is where students are required to notice. What do you notice? And what do you wonder? We talked a lot about wonder in math. This is how we practice it. One example is a which one does not belong. 
I like to begin my numeracy classes with a which one does not belong. You can spend as much time or as little time as you would like on that. There are four set of pictures and students have to decide which one does not belong. There are four correct answers, but they're only correct if you give me the reason why it does not belong. So let's try that one out. I noticed that there are eggs in cartons. And I'm going to start first. The one that I think does not belong is the top left. Do you see which one I'm talking about? Top left. Ooh, direction. That's good for kindergarten at first. Repeat over and over. The reason why that one does not belong is because the eggs... It's the only one where the eggs make a square shape. Have you ever noticed that kids, especially the lower grades, love to try to tell you what you're about to do? They're so curious. Drives you crazy, but we don't want to smash that wonder. So let's just organize it. What do you notice? Who wants to share with me what they notice? What do you wonder? I wonder, I wonder if we're going to like move the dots around, Okay. So, I also introduce a little story. Do y'all love chocolate chip cookies? I love chocolate chip cookies. Oh, yeah. When I make chocolate chip cookies, sometimes I have the best chocolate chip cookies that have like 36 chocolate chips on one cookie. Pretty awesome. Then you might have a sad little cookie that only has one or two chocolate chips. Very sad, right? Well, these are my chocolate chip cookies. Do they have any chocolate chips? So we're going to play a little game. And this is what we're going to do. Can you see each row of cookies? Top row has how many cookies? Five. Next row? Then? Wow. Okay. So we're going to roll a die. And whatever I roll... We each get to decide which row we will put that number of chocolate chips on each of those cookies. Okay? So, for example, if I rolled my die and I got a three, we all would work with three. And I would say, hmm, I'm going to put them on that second row from the bottom. So, how many chocolate chip cookies? Two. Three chocolate chips on the first one. Three chocolate chips on the next one. How many chocolate chips do I have so far? Y'all decided that you, maybe he, one of you, could be all of y'all, decided to put it on the top row. How many chocolate chips do y'all have right now? Fifteen. But we're not going to write the number. We're going to draw little chocolate chips, okay? Okay couple more things. One, we're going to roll the die a total of five times. Second, you cannot give a chocolate chip cookie that already has chocolate chips more chocolate chips. So every row is going to get something. Okay. And lastly, I usually play this game with a six-sided die. Y'all are special, so I'm going to use a 10-sided die. Okay. So what are our options? One through 10, my zero on this is going to represent 10, okay? Let's think through a strategy. Decide, okay. So here's mine. Oh, first roll. I was a little fast, sorry. First roll, and I got a four. Okay, y'all decide. Do you have to do the same thing I do? No. You need to do the same thing that the partner beside you? No. Okay, so I'm going to pick for four. So I'm thinking if it's one through 10, four is about in the middle I think I'm going to put my four chocolate chips on that third row. It's okay if you do the same thing I do. Did I draw a number? No, I'm drawing the circles. This is very important, especially with your artistic students that are not math people. They love the visual. Okay, this will benefit them. All right, did everyone make? Okay, next roll. Oh, man. One. Well, one, obviously, I know where I'm going to put that, and I have a feeling I know where y'all are going to put it, right here on the bottom. So let me see. I've got three cookies with four each. That's 12 plus one more is 13. Okay. Next roll. You ready? Y'all are all playing, right? You're not cheating next. Okay. This, make a sure. Oh, ooh, seven. Ooh, this is tricky. 
8, 9, 10. There's three more options there. Should I put it on the top? If I put it on the top, they look really smart. Okay, I'm going to gamble. I'm going to gamble. I'm going to put it on my second row. All right. Oh, did I do seven? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. So, okay. So I have seven. No, I have four groups of seven. 14, 28 plus 12 is 40 plus one more is 41. Am I right? How many of y'all are beating me right now? How many of y'all have more than 41? Huh. Okay. You ready for next roll? Two. My gamble gonna pay off. Okay, I'm gonna put that one down here. Okay, so let's see. Four groups of seven, twenty, what did I say? 28 plus three groups, no, yeah. Three groups of four is 12, 40, plus my one, plus, so I'm at 45. How many people are y'all, are beating me? Okay, okay. Ready? Last roll. Oh, fingers crossed. How many people have already used the top row? Oh, boy. I'm in trouble. <gasps> Don't do this to me. Oh. All right. So mentally, let's do the math. Do not line it up along the side and carry that I want this up here. Five groups of one is five. Four groups of seven, 28. Three groups of Four is 12, two groups of two is four, one group of one is one, and I have 50. How many people beat me? Oh, okay, that's all right. You know what? Good game. I'll get you the next one. So this game, my kids can probably play it three times within five minutes, okay? But we can also modify it. What if I use a 20-side die? What if I added more rows of cookies? What if I used decks of cards? What if I made cards that had fractions on them? Okay, lots of ways to modify a game. Now, where do I find these games? Here are two resources, and I didn't write this down in the thing because I didn't want to steal anybody's information. These are two of my favorites. I've got probably about 40 or 50 resources that I love to use. Ben Orland's book, Math Games with Bad Drawings, amazing. And he even goes through and explains and gives you different ways to modify a game. And then Michael Minus, he's from Australia, and his website is lovemaths.me. I highly recommend you do not, he's got videos that show you how to play the games. I highly advise you do not show them to your students because he uses his little son to do it so it doesn't seem like it's a, you know, it's, it's babyish, but it's not. He's just, it was during COVID and he said he was going to do a new math game each day that we were locked down, not knowing it was going to be so long. Oh, okay. There's, let's see. Now, let me tell you about some of the lessons I've learned. I'm going to let y'all learn from my mistakes, but I'm perfect. I didn't make any mistakes. Just kidding. When I began playing games, I jumped right into having students play games with each other. Boom. And I quickly learned that that did not work. First, I noticed that students had no idea how to play a game. I'm not talking about following the rules. I'm talking about the character you need to play a game. Sometimes it kind of reminds me of a few grown-ups I know. Maybe me. So start very slowly with very basic games. Students need to learn how to take turns, how to follow rules, how to lose. I throw temper tantrums in front of my students and they tell me, Mrs. Teeple, you need to have better virtues. They need to learn how to win. Do we brag and boast? We would never make our partners feel bad and how to strategize and be patient with your opponent as they strategize before students play each other the class can play whole class games or games against the teachers just like what we did with chocolate chip cookies the teacher can model for students how to play and how to be a good opponent 
sometimes showing them the wrong way and sharing stories from when you were younger and played a game and things did not go well can be some of the best teaching moments. Another lesson that I learned is not to let materials or partners rob you of your game playing time. We don't have a lot of time to work with our students. Begin playing games with strict control over materials. Dice are one of the first materials that we use. So in the lower grades, I get little condiment cups and they shake the dice. And then I have food container boxes. And I have to be very explicit with my fifth and sixth graders on how to roll a dice. You roll it in your hand and you drop it in there. This does not count because I can easily, I'm not finished yet. I'm not, no, not yet, not yet. Hold on. Ah, six. I got six. Okay. Controlling the dice is luck at hand when we do that. Okay. So be very strict with materials. When students play games, partnering up, this is another big thing that will rob you of your time. Partnering up, students should only take a minute or less. Spend the time thinking about how students will partner up. I like rows of students like this because I'll say, all right, we're going to play such and such. Front row, turn your chair. You're going to play, play the person right behind you. Next row, and so on. Some of my teachers go ahead and pre-assign like each month or each quarter. Um, there's no debate on partners. We would never make anyone feel bad. That's a story I always tell my students about how another student made me feel really bad when the PE teacher made me dance with him and he looked at me. No, we're friends. Why would you do that? Anyway, sorry, I digress. Let's see. I learned that it's also important for students to learn how to interact with an opponent. Again, another lesson that I think grown-ups need to learn. You don't always have to agree. I ask students to end every game by shaking hands with their opponent, looking them in the eye, and saying, good game. We can control how we make other people feel. Discussing questions like, what happens if you're partnered with someone you don't want to play with? What do you do? What happens when your partner does not play correctly or tries to control the dice? What if you're proud of yourself for winning? Miss Tebow, Miss Tebow, I beat him five times. Should you brag? What if you keep losing? Should you give up? As the teacher, I love letting my students have a front row seat to what's going on in my mind. I think out loud when I play. Talking about what I notice and I wonder. Wow, I noticed I would not have gone there. Wonder why he went there. Huh. Or, boy, this is a really hard game. I think, I think okay, I'm going to be patient with myself. I'm, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just keep trying. I can do this. Lastly, no matter how basic the skill seems to be in the game, all students, all students will benefit from the practice. They will uncover a deeper understanding and knowledge of concepts and how numbers and operations can be used in several different ways. Basics like, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Left versus right, odd and even, digit versus number, a multiple factor product, prime and composite. The last thing I'm going to leave you with, and I think we might have time, I don't know, maybe for another game. We'll see. The last thing I'm going to leave you with is a note from my students. I asked them what they thought about games. They said, it's hard to lose and it's hard to win. It is hard to be honest. It is hard to remember the rules. It is hard to play with someone that is not your best friend. It is hard when you don't get to go first. Games are fun. Yes, students, hard things can be fun and worthy of our time, especially when we treat them as a puzzle to solve. And teachers, games are definitely worthy of your time. That was Nikki Teeple from Atlanta Classical Academy and her lecture, Playing Games in Mathematics Class, from November 2023. To learn more about the Hoagland Center for Teacher Excellence and register for future events, visit the webpage at k12.hillsdale.edu, click the Events tab, 
and look for Hoagland Center or write to cte at hillsdale.edu. I'm Scott Bertram. We invite you to like us on Facebook. Search for Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education. You also can follow us on Instagram at Hillsdale underscore K-12. Hillsdale underscore K-12 on Instagram. Thank you for listening to the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. Music